All right, so this module, we're gonna now talk about continuous cooling diagrams, which are similar to isothermal transformation diagrams. All right, so in the real world, um, if we're dealing with steel or whatever other material is undergoing a phase transformation, isothermal heat treatments are not always practical. So you can imagine in the example we just did in the previous module, where we did you know, a, a rapid quench from uh, 800 degrees to an intermediate temperature, and then a hold at a very precise amount of time. Uh, and then maybe even uh, other um, uh, transformations within that to get the right microstructure. So those rapid changes in temperature are not always uh, possible. So uh, instead, we often deal with um, continuous cooling. So basically a cooling rate um, diagram. And so we can transform our TTT or isothermal transformation diagram into a continuous cooling transformation or CCT diagram. Um, on uh, Basically, we can trans uh, transfer them very uh, relatively easily. So this diagram um, shows in dashed lines the, uh, the isothermal lines, and then you can see the solid lines, which are now the continuous cooling transformation diagram. So we can basically modify the TTT to give us a CCT diagram. So when we do that, um, this basically shows us or allows us to predict what will happen if we cool at different rates. So here you'll notice that our lines, so all right, so let's just go over real quick again what this diagram is. So we have uh, time on the x-axis. This is usually in log, as you can see, and then temperature, uh, and then again, the highest temperature is above the tectoid, and then the lowest uh, near room temperature. So instead of the isothermal lines, so the horizontal lines here, you'll notice that our paths, which are shown here in red and blue, you can see that they have a curvature to them. And that's a curvature because we're, con uh, we're cooling at a given rate. And it's not linear because the x-axis is not linear. This is a log graph. So essentially, this would be linear if you plotted it uh, in terms of um, uh, linear axes. So that's why we have a slight curvature. But this is a set rate. So how we kind of read this, interpret this, is again, we start above the eutectoid where we would have austenite. And then our lines here, the red line is the start of the austenite to perlite reaction. And then the green line, just like before, is the, the end of that reaction. So in between is where we have the transformation from austenite to perlite. And you'll notice here that we only have, for this eutectoid composition, we only have austenite to perlite and martensite. Uh, this is a, a, a unique one in which um, for this composition, we don't actually form bainite, which we saw in the intermediate temperatures. So you won't see that in this diagram. So this slow cooling, you can see, uh, sometimes called full anneal, um, if we go through the process, we see that it's constantly cooling, uh, it's below the eutectoid, now it starts to form perlite, and then it's finished forming perlite at this point, which is close to uh, 10 to the 2 seconds. Um, of continuously cooling. Um, and because we're forming it at the slowest rates, um, it's equivalent to the higher temperatures, and so we form coarse perlite. If we f more rapidly cool, so it's sort of a mod what they're calling moderate, this is known as normal normalizing sometimes, um, moderately rapid cool. We're still in the perlite region, but you see it's forming faster, so about 10 seconds. Uh, and it's happening at about 550, you see that in this case, we're gonna form a more fine perlite of the two. So that's what we see here. So uh, we bent, begin the transformation, and then 100%, it's fully formed coarse perlite. All right, so like I said, in this one, what we call the plain carbon steel, where there's not many alloying elements, this reaction is relatively fast. You can see that, um, the perlite reaction starts within a second, right? So very rapid. So um, 
for the different regions, we can kind of denote with the different rates. So if we are above the, the blue curve here, we see that we form only perlite. So slower than this rate, we have all perlite, and it can be coarse, fine, depending on the relative rate. And this works out to be 35 degrees per second. So that's a rather rapid cool. Um, in the middle here, you can see that if we do a rate that hits this line, it's going to form perlite, but you'll notice it doesn't go through the green curve. It passes through this black curve, which means that it's incomplete. And so in that case, if it continues to cool, it's going to get down here to, per, uh, to martensite and form martensite from the remaining austenite. So we're going to have a mixture in this range, any cooling rate in this range, we're going to have a mixture of martensite and perlite. And then in this other range, denoted by the red, you see it just encounters this point right here, which is the start of perlite. So anything faster than, um, let me go through this, this middle one again. So in that range, we form perlite, uh, but not 100%. So we also get martensite when it goes below about 220. And then this critical cooling rate Faster than that, we miss what's called the perlite nose. So basically, the most, um, the the closest in time for perlite, and so we only have austenite. We haven't formed uh, perlite until we get down to the 220, and then we form martensite. So if we cool this rapidly, we're going to form only martensite, and that's where the critical cooling rate name comes from is because it's critical to forming martensite, complete martensite. So this is very common with plain carbon steel. We don't see bainite. We only have perlite, fine, uh, coarse and fine perlite, and then martensite if we cool above uh, faster than the critical cooling rate, in this case, 140 degrees per second. And that's a very rapid cool. So um, we can see bainite in some of those higher alloy steels, things like 4340, where we have a lot of alloying elements. And what that does is affects this perlite transformation here. So if we look at this, we see that the perlite transformation in this reaction takes 10 to the 4 seconds, whereas in this previous one, right, it's basically 1 second or 10 seconds, right? So we've basically, the use of those alloying elements, like we saw before, slows down the equilibrium reactions like this one and therefore we can get bainite uh, and so this sort of curve here represents the bainite nose but we can still have per, uh, martensite at the lower temperatures so this is a much more complex one because we have a lot of different ranges here so if we go very uh, slow coolings this blue curve uh, we see that we're going to get uh, ferrite plus perlite because we undergo this ferrite reaction but also the perlite. Uh, the next range would be in this range here in which we get ferrite, perlite, bainite, and martensite. So we actually have a lot of things going on there because we don't fully transform the perlite. So we get some bainite and we can also get martensite. If we go in this next range here, we see that we're going to get um, ferrite, bainite, martensite, because we miss the perlite reaction, which is the second red. Um, and then in the next region, where we kind of miss this uh, ferrite transformation, we only get martensite and bainite. And then this last one is the critical cooling rate, again, because we just miss the bainite and we only get martensite. So there's a lot of different microstructures possible depending on the cooling rate. And so that's what this diagram is telling you. And it's a lot going on, I understand, but you might just kind of take a minute to kind of understand what all of these are going to. The main thing here is that these higher alloys, so a lot of alloying elements are used to be able to get martensite and get bainite because we're slowing down the reaction of perlite. So that's what these additional alloying elements give you, like we talked about before, and it's used uh, to get martensitic steel.